Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I had a minute left on my clock, but it's just as good. It's just as well. Um, welcome on Palm Sunday. If y'all didn't get a uh, Palm Crown, John's got some back in the back, so grab one. Um, we will be waving the palms during both the, the two opening hymns, uh, just so you have that. And um, are they going to, can they take them home with them after? Or oh, how absolutely. Do okay. Take them home with you after. So. Um, you see the announcements in the law. Oh, there's a couple that, that um, your pastor left off, and it's my fault, not the Ireland's fault. Um, Good Friday service will be here in the sanctuary at 7 on Friday evening. Um, and then for the Tuesday, well, Tuesday evening Bible study, the new stuff for our next round, the materials are available in the fellowship hall, so feel free to pick them up. Um, okay. I'm just going to draw your attention to the rest of the announcements. I'm not going to read through them. Other than just to remind the folks that are in the choir for Easter Sunday that there is a rehearsal this afternoon or this morning after um, fellowship, so 11:45. And then, Peggy, did you want to talk about the next PW meeting? Yes, next PW meeting is uh, tentatively planned for the 20th of December, and it's going to be at the fellowship. Hall. Thank you. Other other announcements? No. Well, yeah, the one that was left off is the potluck mix. Oh next Sunday for after church for Easter. Um, there's a sign-up sheet that looks like it's well filled out already, and um, everyone is welcome. And then choir, choir will do the choir like at 9.45 before church. On Easter? Next Sunday? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, Donna, did you want to talk about um, the summer? Yes. Um, we're getting ready to do, I know it's early, but our, um, what is it called? In October we have our, sorry. November we have our Harvest Bazaar. November, yes, I think October, but November Harvest Bazaar. And this year we're going to do the crafts and silent auctions, so if you are ready, you would like to commit crafts for that, um, start thinking about that. I appreciate it if you want to do that. Thank you. Thanks, I appreciate that. Are there other announcements? Let's take a moment of silence to prepare our hearts and minds to worship Almighty God. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the hearts. And I'll invite Donna Gentry to come forward at this time for our Lenten reading. gathered here week after week, sharing a common quest for a deeper faith and a deeper experience of the divine. I invite you now to close your eyes and let go of the things that distract and concern you. Listen, the time is drawing near. Jesus is preparing to enter Jerusalem. How will we greet him? Will we follow him all the way to the cross? The power of Jesus is that we, he lived what he taught, even when it led to his death. He lived with an abiding awareness of God, radiating the light of God in all he said and did. But that light was too much for the world. There are forces today, as there were in ancient Judea, that conspire to put it out. Where are we in this drama? What are we willing to risk to follow Jesus? As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the darkness and pain of illness and disease in the world. Let us pray. Loving God, there are so many choices before us every day. Choices offered by our friends, our families, our culture, our own past. Some of them encourage the well-being of the earth, ourselves, and our neighbors. Others are destructive. Help us to distinguish between them. May we learn from the choices of Jesus and embody compassion, justice, and inclusion in all we say and do. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. Please stand and join us in singing hymn number 197. 
Hosanna, loud Hosanna. So we'll sing all three verses.
that was awesome. Thank you. I should feel very joyful. Join with me in the prayer of confession. God of heaven and earth, we give you thanks for sending Jesus Christ in your name. Even though we were blessed to follow him, we confess that in times of trial, we do not be denied him. Forgive us and heal us, we pray. Help us with our faith, not in the presence of this world, but only in the Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name we pray. It is the Lord who helps us. Who will declare us guilty? Because of the grace we received at baptism, we have nothing to fear. We are freed and we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And as we have reconciled with God, let us reconcile with one another by a sharing of Christ's peace, saying, the peace of the Lord be with you, and responding, and also with you. Peace be with you. Now to the time of sharing our joys and our concerns with each other and lifting them to God. And before we go into our prayer time, I will ask if there are any additional prayer requests, joys, or concerns that you all might want to share with each other and with God. Tammy. Um, my sister's going in tomorrow to see a cardiologist. And um, so just, you know, prayers for healing, but also prayers for extra skills in the doctor's diagnosis and treatment. Thanks, Tammy. Appreciate that. We will pray. Oh, Deborah. Thanks, Marilyn. Let's put her on the prayer list going forward. Thank you. Are there others? Julie. Um, yeah, I can't think of her name, but she works at the Chevron. I think her name's Renee. She went in and had a big toe cut off. Oh. oh. So, prayers for healing on that. Definitely. That sounds painful. Pat. I spent some time with Dave Gibby yesterday in his fight with all that's going on there. But anyway, that young man's doing way better. Good. Hallelujah. Prayers work, you know? They do. There you go. There you go. Other joys or concerns? All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy and merciful God, we come today before you grateful for the opportunity to worship and to celebrate. We know that not every follower of you has that opportunity to worship freely and to celebrate joyfully in community. So we don't take the opportunity to be here for granted. And we are grateful for it. God, you've heard the prayer requests spoken aloud. And we lift them to you saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Holy One, we continue to lift up Jim and Sue. Maisie, Milt, Jay Hook and his family, and we pray to you saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we lift up Jay Lish, Alicia Price, continue to lift up Ben Giddy, Lori, Haley Curtis, and Billy Joe Skinner, 
And we pray these things saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we lift up Jonah and Mary Gear, the Jean Poltz family, Kara Lee, Steve Landendike, Sarah Lau, and Ross and Linda Walker. And we pray these things saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue to lift up Rossi, Doralee Meza, Dixie Ledbetter, Dustin Holston, McKay Hansen, Pastor Joy, Kathy Hogan, and Damian Henderson. And we pray these things saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we continue to lift up the Belize mission victims of violence and disaster, our country and its leaders, the people of the world, especially the people and children of the Ukraine. And God, we ask for and pray for peace in our homes, in our communities, and the world. And we pray these things saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we know that there are prayers that we sometimes just simply cannot express aloud. So we take a moment of silence to lift those prayers to you as well. And we lift all of these prayer concerns, these joys, these concerns, whether spoken aloud or from the silence of our hearts. We lift them to you, Holy One, and pray them in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing hymn number 215, What Wondrous Love Is This?
<clears throat> Our first reading today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 6 through 9. <clears throat> I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will, who will declare my guilty. All of them will wear out like a garment, and the moth will eat them up. Our second reading today comes from the book of Psalms. Psalms 118, verses 19 through 29. This is a song of victory. Open to me the gates of the righteousness, and I may, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, that righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The Lord is the, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Our third reading today comes from Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 to 40. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the, of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Sisters and brothers, all three of these readings are God's word for God's people. And we respond by saying, Thanks be to God. So, I love parades. St. Patrick's Day, the Rose Parade, Macy's Thanksgiving Parade, our own Fourth of July Parade. I love all of them. 
and does not uncommon for me to leave the house hours before a parade starts so I can stake out the best spot. Now, picking the just the right spot to watch a parade is critical. I'm not a fan of watching parades from the back, even though I'm tall enough to see over most people. So the perfect spot for me is right up front, somewhere where I can put my lawn chair out and have space for my cooler. And no, I'm not afraid of raining on my parade. What I love about the whole parade experience is the excitement and the anticipation. I can't wait to be dazzled by the floats and the costumes, the sounds of marching bands, and even the sight of politicians marching in solidarity. But most of all, what I like about the, ex the parade experience is the shared sense of community I have with other spectators. So when I read the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, I smile because I can relate to the excitement felt by Jesus' followers on that day. For three years, this itinerant, radical young rabbi has been traveling around the countryside preaching, teaching, and gathering disciples, much to the consternation of the serious religious, as Brian McLaren refers to them in his book, We Make the Road by Walking. At first, I imagine that the Pharisees weren't all that worried. Oh, that Jesus, I imagine them saying to each other, shaking their heads at the folly of youth, he'll never amount to much. This is all going to blow over. But, as Jesus' popularity grew, and as more and more people started paying attention to the message, and actually believing in it, the serious religious began to get nervous. The Pharisees began to show up at places where Jesus' followers were gathered to get a first-hand look at what was going on. Time and time again, these serious religious folk challenged Jesus in an attempt to trip him up. And time and time again, they failed. So, is it any wonder that the people who, who were charged with maintaining the religious status quo became increasingly concerned with what they saw as a threat to their authority? Still, nothing could, could have prepared the Pharisees or the disciples, for that matter, for what was going to happen that morning. It started out simply enough. Jesus was headed to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, and he asked a couple of his disciples to go into a village and bring him a colt that they would find tied up in the village square. After the disciples complied, they spread their cloaks on the colt and helped Jesus climb on. As they continued on towards the holy city, crowds began to line the road, waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna! Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. The hopes, the dreams, the excitement that Jesus might actually be the one who was finally going to free the Israelites from the yoke of bondage to the Roman Empire was at an all-time high. As you might expect, this didn't sit well with the Pharisees, who were all out and about mingling with the crowd. And you've got to remember that the Pharisees' primary concern was the potential loss of their own power and position, but they were also concerned about the reaction of Rome. In their minds, Jesus posed a double threat. Not only was their hold on the spiritual life of the Jewish people being challenged, but so was the entirety of the Roman occupation which the Pharisees and the Sadducees had been collaborating with. It's important to note here that the occupying Romans were cruel and ruthless when it came to dealing with anyone who challenged their authority. So this totally spontaneous, unplanned parade was the serious religious folks' worst nightmare come true. They rushed up to Jesus and sternly warned him that all of this shouting and commotion was dangerous 
And then he needed to stop his followers right now. And I love Jesus' response. If they were silent, the stones would shout. Now, contrast this joyful ragtag parade led by the Prince of Peace with another parade happening that day, one the citizens of Jerusalem would have been all too familiar with. Whenever King Herod would enter, enter Jerusalem from his headquarters in Caesarea Philippi, he would enter not on a colt but a mighty war horse. He wouldn't be surrounded by folks waving palm branches, but instead he would have been accompanied by uniformed soldiers with their swords, spears, and bows held high. They would have been decked out in full armor and marching in precise formation, all of which was designed to show the full military might and power of the Roman Empire. This particular Herod, by the way, was the son of Herod the Great, who ruled at the time of Jesus' birth, and who had been installed as a puppet ruler by the occupied, by the occupying Romans. And it's interesting to note that while both father and son were Jewish, they were seen for what they really were, collaborators, and as such, they were hated and reviled by everyday ordinary Israelis. So Herod's parade was not only a deliberate and calculated show of force meant to inspire fear and compliance, but also a way to reinforce the status quo of Roman rule, which at that point had been lasted 100 years and would last for 300 more after the crucifixion. The fact that Herod chose this particular day to ride into Jerusalem is significant because it was the beginning of Passover. I suspect that he and his Roman overlords were expecting trouble, or at the very least wanted to be prepared in case some sort of disruption happened. This was, after all, one of the most important days on the Jewish calendar, and Jews from all around the known world would have been in Jerusalem to participate in the festivities. Seems like it was a situation ripe for trouble, as there was no way that those folks attending Passover would have been happy about pagan Romans occupying the holy city. Now, at this point, it would be very easy for me to draw a contrast between church and state, noting how the kingdom of the state often rules by fear, and with threats of violence demanding submission, while the kingdom of heaven rules by faith and with a promise of peace inspiring joy. It's a valid argument for sure, but what if we look at it a different way? What does it look like if we substitute the church versus state argument with a Christian versus Christian one? We are all familiar with churches and ministries who rule with an iron fist, making it clear that we risk losing God's love if we don't comply with their rules. We are all familiar with churches and ministries who see submission and obedience to a twisted form of the gospel, be it a literal reading of scripture or the heresy of prosperity gospel, as being the only possible way to salvation. We are all familiar with churches and ministries who take a few selected passages from Scripture and, reading them out of context, use them as justification for treating fellow Christians in a decidedly unchristian manner. And we are all familiar with churches and ministries where the leaders are more interested in maintaining the status quo and their own positions of power and authority rather than helping their followers lead righteous lives. Here's the thing. Jesus spent his entire ministry teaching and preaching against exactly these types of people, situations, and institutions. And if we read just a bit further into Luke's account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, starting at verse 45, we see that Jesus at the apex of his ministry and entering Jerusalem in triumph 
goes straight to the temple and causes a huge scene. He drives out the merchants who sell animals for sacrifice. He drives out the money changers. He challenges the status quo and links together quotes from two of the greatest prophets of Judaism, Isaiah and Jeremiah. My house will be a house of prayer for all people, Isaiah says. But you have turned it into a hideout for crooks, Jeremiah says. This is the only time in the entirety of Scripture where we see Jesus exhibiting the very human emotion of anger. The cleansing of the temple was a reaction to what had become the status quo within the Jewish faith. The changing of money and selling animals for sacrifice were long-standing conveniences and practices that had nothing to do with the sacred rituals of worship. And the money changers and the vendors were allowed to ply their trade in the temple itself with the complete blessing of the serious religious folk. And I have to wonder if the temple officials got a cut of the profits. Here's the thing. Those long-standing conveniences and practices, which actually were meant to assist the Jewish people in their worship, had become corrupted by those who weren't interested in furthering the worship of those who came to the temple, but who were only interested in making a buck or two at the expense of the faithful. The corruption had become a normalized part of the status quo. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem was the culmination of a ministry that was all about disrupting the status quo. While many of those who waved palm branches that morning were hoping for a different type of disruption, there were plenty of folks who understood and celebrated the fact that Jesus was offering the chance to live a life free of the status quo of a religion that had maybe lost its way. So 2,000 years on, it begs the question, are there religious practices and customs in our lives and in the life of our churches which are considered normal but have nothing to do with furthering the gospel? Are there religious practices and customs in our own lives and in the life of our churches which have been discarded and perhaps need to be re-examined reestablished or renewed? Are we willing to be disruptors of the 21st century status quo in our lives and in the life of the church? And are we willing to be disruptors of the status quo in service to the gospel? There were two parades that entered Jerusalem that day. One was all about maintaining the status quo, and the other was all about the disruption of the same. People are still marching in both of those parades 2,000 years later. So I ask you, which parade are you marching in? Amen. Now is the time for our morning offering, and I'll invite the ushers to come forward. God, we return a portion of your generous bounty to you for the use of the furtherance of your kingdom in our community and in the world. 
We ask your blessings on these gifts, on those who gave and those who were unable to give. May your grace and mercy shine equally on all. These things we pray in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing and join us in our closing hymn, number 223, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Glory Christ, as we enter Holy Week, may we always remember that our Lord's sacrifice was made for each and every one of us. And may God watch between me and thee while we were absent one from another, and all God's people said, Amen.